Who are you? Who am I? What is the essence of humankind? What does it mean to be human? Human nature refers to the fundamental traits of humanity, our most basic and natural ways of thinking, feeling, and acting. Human nature is supposed to be this universal concept that, regardless of nurture, regardless of our environmental, social, political, and psychological conditions, we cannot truly transcend. I disagree. There are certain instincts we possess that I might consider universal to humanity. For instance, fear as a means of basic survival, or disgust as a means of self-preservation from disease. Yet not everyone experiences fear or disgust. And what we fear or disgust varies considerably from person to person, place to place, culture to culture. Some people fear the depths of the ocean, Others fear the peaks of the mountains. Some people are disgusted by even the idea of eating crickets. For others, it's a healthy treat. The balance of our hormones may also play a role in determining how we behave. But we are not slaves to our hormones. We can and do override our base impulses when the situation calls for it. We also, obviously, have certain shared needs. Things like air, water, food, sleep, and shelter. We want safety, respect, and connection. We seek pleasure, but how we meet those needs vary also according to culture, climate, and identity. If human nature is just what humans do, then it is a concept of contradiction. Humans hate and humans love. Humans are violent and humans are peaceful. Humans destroy and humans create. Humans form hierarchies and humans tear them down. But when people bring up human nature, particularly in arguments about the viability of liberation from systems of oppression such as capitalism, patriarchy, and the state, they never seem to highlight our noblest features, only our most despicable. Humanity is defamed by humans themselves. To the misanthropes and their ilk, we are all just agents of chaos and wanton environmental destruction. They sweep aside the vast antagonisms of class, gender, and race. They dismiss the distinctions between authoritarian empires and stateless societies, assigning all equal accusation. Capital H-U-M-A-N-I-T-Y overrides the examination of the social relationships and institutions that have forged our present outcomes. So the question persists. Our journey begins to discover what exactly constitutes human nature. I'm not the first person to explore the idea of human nature. Across history and throughout the world, theorists and philosophers have posited different interpretations of the concept. Socrates believed that the life most suited to human nature involved reasoning. His student Plato and Plato's student Aristotle developed a notion of the human soul in the 4th and 5th century BCE that consisted of two parts, one home to instinct, passion and desire, the other home to logic and reason. Aristotle in particular also recognized man as political, meaning able to develop complex communities and systems, and mimetic, meaning able to use his imagination to create artwork. I say man and not humanity because... Aristotle saw women as subject to men, of course. Elsewhere, Mencius, a Confucian philosopher in the 4th century BCE, argued that human nature was good, with an innate tendency to an ideal state formed under the right conditions. To him, the four beginnings of human nature's morality were a sense of compassion that develops into benevolence, a sense of shame and disdain that develops into righteousness, a sense of respect and courtesy that develops into propriety, and a sense of right and wrong that develops into wisdom. He believed that the development of virtues came from reflection, and if one didn't reflect, they wouldn't develop their moral constitution. According to Mencius, evil came from a lack of reflection and self-development in one's natural direction. However, another Confucian philosopher in the 3rd century BCE disagreed. Junxi believed human nature was essentially bad, and that learning was the only cure for the destructive and competitive natural ways of humanity. Later on, 
the legalist framework of human nature would embrace the notion of it being inherently evil. However, unlike Junshi, they didn't think even education or self-cultivation could eliminate or alter one's fundamentally sick nature. Echoing many of today's proponents of capitalism, 3rd century BCE legalist philosopher Han Fei argued that everyone is motivated by their unchanging selfish core to take advantage of whoever they can, especially when they know they can get away with it. Similarly, Emile Durkheim believed humanity to be naturally egoistic, and David Hume assumed humans were driven by selfishness and emotions and needed society to make them more reasonable. However, Hume also recognized that humans had an innate sense of honor, beauty, and nobility. In contrast, according to Akan philosophy, what it means to be a person is to selflessly contribute to one's family and community. Of course, adjusted for one's level of opportunity. The size or type of contribution matters far less than the practice itself. Further east along the West African coast, the Yoruba held similar beliefs. To be a person is to be substantially dependent on others. The community is the basis for the actualization of one's values and personality. This position can also be found in the Pan-African philosophy of Ubuntu, a form of African humanism developed in the 1950s that sees humanity as a quality we owe to each other. It can be neatly summarized by its particularly iconic phrase, I am because we are. Yoruba philosophy also recognizes that while humanity retains certain activities and needs, the way those activities are carried out and those needs are met are subject to change according to ever-evolving material conditions. Karl Marx's concept of species being was similarly informed by materialist analysis. He argued against traditional concepts of human nature as incarnating in individuals in favor of human nature forming within social relations. To Marx, human nature wasn't permanent or universal, but rather always determined in a specific social and historical formation. Humans change their environments, and their environments, in turn, change them. The Raramuri tribe in the Sierra Madres region of what is now Mexico have traditionally believed in Ibigara, the idea that all life forms are interconnected and share the same breath. Even the land itself and the winds that blow through it check in. Obviously, the sheer variety of the philosophies of indigenous cultures cannot be painted with one broad brush, but we can identify certain similarities. Many indigenous philosophies have recognized that we cannot be divorced from our environments. There is no neat separation between human and nature. We are part of the same family. Life can only be viable when humans view nature as kin, all part of the same ecosystem, enhancing and preserving given and taken. Anthropologists refer to this way of seeing the world as animism. Because animists believe all beings are related, they heavily regulate their interaction with living systems. For the most part, an asterisk do indeed apply. That means that while they may fish, hunt, gather and farm, they do so while remaining cognizant of the sustainability of those systems. They do so in the spirit of reciprocity, not extraction. They live by the principles of what today's ecological economists would call a steady state economy. Never extract more than ecosystems can generate and never waste or pollute more than ecosystems can safely absorb. The decline of animist ontology has coincided with the rise of capitalism, which has continued to sever our bond with nature, leading to many people embracing the view that human nature is fundamentally destructive. Human presence has come to be seen as a threatening corruption of the natural world. We've become estranged from our role as a species of stewards. Welcome everyone to the final round of Musical Chairs Death Battle. We have quite the crowd out here today in the stadium for this fantastic finale as each round more and more teams have been eliminated. With each round, teams have lost not just a seat on one of the coveted musical chairs, but also their lands, their homes, their food, their livelihoods, their healthcare, their children, and more. Competition has gotten absolutely vicious as the tournament has continued, with former allies turning bitter rivals as they fight to survive against the onslaught of the prevailing champions. 
the Taino, the Yoruba, the Maya, the Wet'suwet'en, the Kalinago, and the other fan favorites have been knocked out by our all-time champions, Team Empire. However, everything is on the line with this finale, as the question remains, who will win the last chair? Team Aiti has admirably held its ground throughout the tournament, but Team Empire looks about ready to take them out once and for all. Let's listen in on what's happening on the field as the two competitors, George Hobbs Columbus and Jean James Aiti, face off for the final chair. I don't see what we're fighting, man. Look at all these chairs. Clearly, there's enough to go around. So what game are we playing? There are other ways to live with each other, be with each other, where life isn't just a competition for a place to rest. I mean, look at us. What we're doing to each other is making all of our lives worse off. And for what? All this violence and devastation. For what? Money. Power. Control. It is our birthright. We are empire. And we won't rest until all this world's chairs are ours. You will sit where we want you to sit. You will stand when we want you to stand. You will fight viciously amongst each other for a seat at the table like crabs in a barrel. We will enjoy our thrones of profit because we will own you and you will take whatever we choose to give you. You will struggle and you will toil for the mere button on the cushion of our footstool. And when we win this competition, you will beg us for the right to sit and kneel. <laughs> That's some good old fashioned smack talk if I ever heard it. Welcome back to the best place you could be on a weekday in the presence of the spectacular, stupendous, and intoxicating spectral of competition. I can't imagine anywhere more enlightening, more emmatic, more eBay than what we've been blessed to observe with our orbital globes today. Mm, you smell that? That's the vivacious energy coming from this glorious crowd as we get ready for the incredible finale of Musical Chairs Death Battle, beginning right after this word from our sponsors, Chairs for Africa. Yes, Chairs for Africa, where every chair, and I mean every chair, Team Empire wins, they'll graciously donate beautifully reused, refurbished, and re-ready-to-love chairs to the somehow impoverished people of Africa. Truly touches my heart. We'll see you after this. We are told that human nature is selfish, greedy, and competitive. But the truth is that we have a range of possibilities encoded in our biology. We can be aggressive or we can be peaceful. We can be patriarchal or we can be egalitarian. We can be cruel or we can be kind. We can be competitive or we can be cooperative. Some claim that war has been a fact of human life basically since we carved the first spear. But war is not inevitable. It's a consequence of certain socio-political and economic arrangements. Some stateless societies knew only peace for centuries before having to defend themselves from waves of colonization, enslavement, genocide, invasion, disease, and more. Others claim that patriarchy and gerontocracy are baked into human nature. They are, after all, some of the oldest forms of oppression. But the existence of long-standing gender and age egalitarian societies, such as the Mbuti and the Hadza, as well as the fluidity of gender as a concept recognized even in prehistoric art, highlights that neither patriarchy nor gerontocracy are unassailable. Is hierarchy human nature? Now, expertise may always exist in some form or fashion, but hierarchy at least in the way that anarchists use the term, relies on the principle of authority, which is a social construct subject to change that empowers the ruler in an ongoing hierarchical relationship to give commands and make the subordinate obey under threat of violence. Humans have cooperatively self-governed their lives for thousands upon thousands of years without rulers. We are capable of both authoritarian and anti-authoritarian behavior. Avoiding authoritarianism and maintaining egalitarianism relies on a conscious understanding of one's material conditions and an anarchic determination to resist social arrangements that give some people the advantages and ability to impose their will on others. Peaceful, egalitarian societies 
have long existed alongside patriarchal warmongers throughout our history. Which traits predominate in our society is determined by what our material conditions incentivize. Everyone can learn cooperative behavior when they have the need or desire to do so. In nearly all natural disasters, cooperation and solidarity among people increase, and it is common people, not governments, who volunteer to do most of the work carrying out rescues and protecting one another throughout crises. Without our capacity for altruism, built upon the evolutionary foundation of mutual aid and cooperative child rearing, we would not be human. That isn't to deny the role of mutual struggle, but it must be stressed that the dominance of greed, selfishness, and competition are an outcome of specific social arrangements and material conditions. Whether acting in one's self-interest to pursue personal well-being produces cooperation or oppression is determined by the systems and individual is embedded within. As British philosopher Andrew Collier wrote in Marx, A Beginner's Guide, to look at people in capitalist society and conclude that human nature is egoism is like looking at people in a factory where pollution is destroying their lungs and saying that it is human nature to cough. Ultimately, the conditions in our society are what shapes what human nature is, how it develops, and what aspects of it are made manifest. Egalitarian societies and hierarchical societies will shape people in radically different ways. Both are within the realm of future possibilities. We know that human beings have the ability to think and learn for ourselves, that we are social creatures capable of organizing ourselves without hierarchy, and that we can recognize and oppose injustice. With these three characteristics in mind, by recognizing and opposing the conditions that favor domination and proposing horizontal social arrangements to actively reshape our powers, drives, and consciousness, we can bring forth our liberation. Human nature is a mythology of social control, weaponized to simplify our complexity and reify the way that present society is organized, whether via divine right, original sin, or sociobiology. Human nature is a lazy mental shortcut to avoid confronting preconceived notions, prejudices, and assumptions. Human nature is an effective propaganda tool, limiting our recognition of our possibilities and serving the constriction of our education and imagination. Anarchists are accused of demanding too much from human nature, but I think it's quite the opposite. We're told that without the state, the world would descend into chaos, that the state protects us from bad people. No. As Kropotkin rightfully argued in Are We Good Enough? Both rulers and ruled are spoiled by authority, and both exploiters and exploited are spoiled by exploitation. The powerful are corrupted by power, and the powerless become either servile or rebellious or apathetic. Even if human nature was wicked, as some people say it is, providing avenues to power over others would be a terrible mistake. We don't need perfect people to spark a social revolution. We just need people willing to question and transform our economy, politics, relationships, technologies, cultures, philosophies, education, and identities in an anarchic manner. It won't happen overnight, nor will it entirely eliminate conflict between people. But slowly and surely, fueled by the indomitable human spirit, the social revolution will bring out the untapped potential of freedom embedded within our so-called human nature. We have not arrived at the end of history. Change is not only possible, it is inevitable. All power to all the people. Peace. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow people. Thanks once again, of course, to the family, including our newest members, Milo, Joe Nagel, David Walsby Payne, Devin Curtis, Gina Van Arnhem, and Eileen McCall. Join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash St. True. Check out all my other videos for a range of radical topics. Follow me on Twitter at underscore St. True. Thanks again. 
peace. 